I'm Alex, Alex Bauer. I come from Branch. You probably have heard of us as a mobile measurement partner. Uh, MMP keeps coming up today, but we're best known for our mobile linking platform. The topics we are covering today are SK Ad Network 4.0 and Privacy Sandbox on Android. So if you are tired of hearing about really disruptive privacy things that are great for users but a lot of work for you, don't worry, there's going to be more of them. But today, the good news is there actually is some good news here. So uh, these two topics are typically two different hour-long webinars. When I do them, we're going to go through them in the next 19 and a half minutes together. So I hope you're all ready. Starting with the landscape, we are in the middle of a generational change in how users consider privacy. We have legislators making legislations. We have regulators making regulations and also at this point like filing lawsuits. We have platforms making new policies and we have the users who are all paying a lot more attention. And this is just it's a, such a complicated situation that it is literally impossible to predict what's going to happen next. The dynamic is too complex. When we look at ad measurement, that means that in the past, everything was nice and simple. You could combine everything and understand what was going on. But on iOS in particular, as you've been hearing today, that's not possible anymore. SK Ad Network messes everything up, and it's living off there in its own silo. You don't have an easy way to get a good view of how everything is working anymore. Similar changes are coming on Android. They are not going to be as severe. I'm going to spend most of the time today talking about SK Ad Network just because that is the train that is coming down the tracks more quickly. But Android changes are coming too. They're not going to be as severe. We'll talk about why, but they should be on your radar. Three topics for today. What is SK Ad Network? What is new in SK Ad Network 4.0? As I said, it's coming soon. It's the train that's on the tracks. And we're going to talk about it most of today because it's also the train with the driver that doesn't care if you get out of the way. So you're going to have to be ready. Android is also coming. But the way that Google is approaching this means that as long as everybody learned the message from scan and doesn't delay too long, you really shouldn't have to do that much. Google is being very collaborative. They're working with the, uh, the rest of the ecosystem to make sure that this is a much smoother transition. And I'll end with a few thoughts on how you can prepare for both of these changes and other ones that are going to be like them in future. So scan 4.0. Let's start with the history of scan. Just brief recap. Scan 1.0 is back in 2000. Uh, I think it's like 2017, it's iOS 11. It's way back there in the beginning of history. I think it's the previous version of the Matrix. If you got this meme, good for you. But the first modern version of SK Ad Network is 2.0. This is what came with the app tracking transparency policy and like the IDFA apocalypse in the middle of 2020. It's the first one we really need to actually pay attention to. Apple's made incremental improvements since then. There are a bunch of them, but they've all been incremental. They haven't addressed some of the really systemic issues that cause a lot of pain with scan. And in 4.0, that's finally starting to change. There are four major improvements in scan 4.0. We're going to go through each of them in detail. But before we do, I need to introduce this concept of crowd anonymity. This is Apple's term, but we're going to use it. In older versions of SK Ad Network, you had this concept of a privacy threshold. If you passed the privacy threshold, you got some more information about your campaign performance, which was great. In Scam 4.0, it's no longer just one threshold. Now there are three different groups that you can have users falling into. So Apple describes this as less, more, or most. But the idea is, as you get more users in the campaign, Apple is going to progressively unveil more information about how your campaign is performing. It's no longer just all or nothing. So remember this concept, crowd anonymity. It plays into some of the other improvements. First of these, though, is scan attributions for web. This is pretty straightforward. Previous versions of SK Ad Network, you could do app-to-app -app measurement, and that was it. The new version of SK Ad Network supports web apps, web to app ads. And this is, this is really cool because it really it, it unlocks a lot of new acquisition options that were possible in the past 
became impossible for a little while and will now be back on the table. It's pretty cool. Next improvement is what Apple calls hierarchical source identifiers. In the past, you had this parameter called campaign ID, and you could assign one of 100 values to it. You always got them back, but it was just one of 100. New version of SK Ad Network, you are going to get 10x more space to work with. Instead of 1 to 99, now it's 0 to 9,999. There's a lot more signal space here. And the number of digits that you get back depends on this crowd anonymity concept. I told you it was coming back. So let's look at an example. You could have a four-digit source identifier, and you can assign these four digits any way you want. Actually, in reality, it will be up to the ad network mostly to optimize that. So they'll be doing it behind the scenes for you. But there are four digits, and if you are in the low crowd anonymity bucket, you get the same two that you always did. As you get further up the crowd anonymity scale, you'll get three digits, and then you'll get all four digits. So you just, you have layers. You can have more data here, which is going to be really useful for optimizing and segmenting the campaigns. Next, we have hierarchical conversion values. So this one's pretty cool, but it also is the more complicated one. In the past, you had this, this six-bit number. It, you know, you could do digits 0 to 63. It was useful, but you got it only once. In SK Ad Network 4, there are two different versions of this value. And the MMP should be helping you take care of this. You shouldn't need to worry about the actual implementation details too much, but it's useful to know the theory behind it. So you've got the fine-grained, which is the same as before, and then you have this new coarse-grained thing, which is low, medium, and high. And yes, this means there's two different low, medium, and high things in SK Ad Network 4, so on behalf of Apple, I apologize. But only one of these is going to be returned. And the version that you get, whether it's fine-grained or coarse-grained, is going to depend on the crowd anonymity level. So let's look at an example. Imagine your user has done something in your app, and you decide this thing, maybe it's like they, they signed up for a subscription. Uh, you're going to assign that a coarse value of high. They're high potential. They've, they've done a subscription, like they're high value. But you're also going to assign them the specific number of 42. So the crowd anonymity level here plays in if you're in the low bucket, you get nothing. That's kind of similar to how things are today. If you're in the medium bucket, you probably would have got nothing in the past because who knows where Apple will set the threshold, but it was probably lower. Now they're going to give you something. At least you know they're a high potential user. And then if you get all the way to the top level of crowd anonymity, you get all of the information, the 42 value. This plays into multiple postbacks, but let's talk first about multiple postbacks. In the past, you got one, you know, one time ever about that user, and if that was all you got, you just had to make the best of it. It had this complicated and honestly a little bit bizarre concept of rolling timers, so it's really difficult to work with, but you got that one signal. Now in SK Ad Network 4, you get three chances to get a signal. So this is three times more capacity for learning about what the user has done after you acquired them. And Apple got rid of that annoying rolling timer. Now these postbacks come at specific intervals, and you can predict when those are going to happen. So it's a lot less complicated. If we think of a timeline example, user installs on day one, or actually day zero in this case, and then they do something interesting within the first two days. You get to decide what you count as interesting, but let's say it's create an account. So at the end of two days, you're going to get a post back that said they installed and they created an account. In the past, this is all you got ever. You were done. But in the new version of SK Ad Network, they can do something interesting in days three to seven. Maybe they start a trial. And you can get information that that happened. And then from 8 to 35, it's again, you get a third post back that maybe you can say they've done a script subscription at the end of their free trial. So the, the basic information here is SK Ad Network is giving you more data signal. You get more chances to understand what's happening, and you can do that beyond just the first 24 hours or so, which especially for subscription apps is really valuable because you probably don't know enough about the user within those first 24 hours to know if they're going to be good. There is one layer of complication on top of this, though. Not all of those postbacks can have every version of the SK Ad Network conversion value. Only the first one can actually get this fine value. 
The other two are eligible only for this course value. So in practice, this means you'd install, you'd get more information about the create account, and then you just get less granular information about what happens in the second and third postbacks. It's good to know about this, but also it's something that you shouldn't have to worry about in too much depth because the MMP is going to be responsible for abstracting that for you. So takeaways here. SKR Network 4 gives you more data in more situations. It reduces the complexity of the system because honestly, I think Apple basically said, SKR Network, it needs to be perfect. We're going to take every possible option and we're going to compile them in one big mess and hopefully it works. And I think they've realized with version four that that's not possible. So basically, this is not a perfect system, but it's a lot closer to, I think, what we would have hoped Apple had done the first time around two years ago. It would have reduced a lot of this pain. It's important to know, though, that the timeline for this introduction is not clear yet. Apple said later this year, given Apple's history with introductions of things like this, it could be early next year. It's not yet. So it's still coming in the future. And a reality check is it's not going to be retroactive. So you can't just wipe the slate clean from previous versions of SK Ad Network. You're going to have to deal with all of this, or somebody is going to be having to deal with this complication on your behalf for a while. So let's move on to Android's Privacy Sandbox, because I see this counter is ticking right on down. Android Privacy Sandbox is intended to be less disruptive. The way Google's approaching this, they want it to be covering all of the same things that were previously possible with GAID, device ID type measurement. And so they are working really closely with MMPs, with ad networks, with select customer uh, groups that they're interviewing to make sure that they don't break things when they roll this out. So it's a much more, uh, it's a much more stable rollout process. But there are four different parts of the Android Privacy Sandbox, and most of them are coming from Chrome. So Privacy Sandbox, a few years ago, came to web first, trying to get rid of th third-party cookies. Now they're bringing the same kinds of things to Android, and they're trying to get rid of the GAID. The four proposals in here, number one is what we call the SDK runtime. This is basically an easier, safer way for apps to integrate third-party SDKs. It's intended to make it possible for you to get an SDK in and not have to worry about whether it's staying up to date or whether it's causing security or privacy issues. Second one is the attribution reporting API, which you can probably think of as Google's answer to SK Ad Network. It's kind of the mic drop answer. We can do this better, but it's supposed to fill the same hole. Third thing is the topics API. If you remember anything in the news a while back about like Flock, Federated Learning of Cohorts, this is the spiritual successor to this. The idea is you can figure out how to show an ad to people who have specific interests. And Topics is going to tell you what those interests are so you don't have to keep track of it. And then the fourth one is Fledge. If you have ever worked with an audience building tool which involves setting criteria and getting a list of device IDs and then shipping those device IDs off to an ad network so they can target them for you, Fledge is supposed to replace that without the need for those device IDs anymore in a privacy first way. Let's go into the timeline here because it's a lot more relaxed than what Apple has been doing. It's a two-year timeline at minimum, and it's always possible Google might extend this. We're about a third of the way through right now. So at the point today, standing here on stage, Google has released developer previews, and a bunch of companies are busy testing those, but it's not yet in a shipping public version of Android, so you can't test it all the way through with a real live audience yet. Google has made clear that they are not going to get rid of the old techniques until at least early 2024. So provided that everyone around the industry has learned the lesson of scan and doesn't wait until the last possible moment, this should be a lot smoother because there'll be plenty of time to test it. Going into two of the proposals that I think are the most useful and interesting here, a little bit more detail. The SDK runtime, previously, if you integrated an SDK, it was basically copying and pasting a big chunk of code and putting it into your app, which as long as you trust the vendor is actually not that bad. You know, 
it's, a, it's code. It's going to do what code is designed to do. But it does have some complications because you have to ask, is this vendor reliable? Are they going to be trying to access things that they technically shouldn't need to? And the SDK runtime makes that super straightforward. The SDK can now live in its own separate execution sandbox alongside your app instead of inside it. And that comes with some really neat benefits around SDK updates too, because now it means that if there's a bug in the SDK or if something changes in the ecosystem and you want to release a quick bug fix from the SDK's side, you will no longer have to update your app to make that happen. It's like they, they, list, they live in separate places and the, uh, the Google Play Services API can update the SDK separately from the app. So that, that's actually gonna be a pretty cool improvement. The other one is the attribution reporting API. And I'm not going to go in as much detail on this as I did with Scan, because you don't need to know. That's the beauty of this. If everything goes smoothly, this will be happening behind the scenes. It's, it's gonna be like switching out the engine of the car while you're driving it down the highway, but hopefully the mechanics can do that and the driver doesn't need to know about it. Some of the highlights of what the attribution reporting API makes possible though is you will get aggregated reporting kind of like you see on an MMP dashboard today, with a lot more detail than scan makes possible. You can specify exactly which dimensions you want to drill in on, which is way better than what scan provides. But you can also get these event level postbacks with less detail that you could ship back to your ad network and say, please use this to optimize for this being a va uh, like a valuable campaign. I'll get early signals to know that it's worth spending more here before I get all of my information back in like a week. You can report on post install events, much more than scan allowed. You can do re-engagement campaigns. That's something that uh, Apple still hasn't introduced to scan. If you already got the user to download the app, there's no way to find a way to retarget and measure that. And it supports all combinations of web to app journeys, which scan is still not there. Looking at both of these changes and how they apply to the future, the trends here are pretty clear at this point. Like privacy is a big thing. It's not going away. These device level identifiers, whether they're third party cookies or IDFA or GAID, those are on the way out. So the question now is, how do we make sure that these replacements are not incredibly disruptive? How do we make sure that they still answer the same kind of business metrics and business decisions that we've needed, but just in a new way? The four things that I recommend doing as you're setting yourself up for success here is don't assume that you have to figure this out on your own. Like at this point, everyone in the industry knows that this is the way things are going. And with these new versions of Scan and Privacy Sandbox, they require some changes, but you should be looking to your ad networks and your MMP vendor and everyone else to say, this is complicated, but it's your job to take care of it. Like you shouldn't have to spend a ton of time actually going through the specifications to implement it in your app. It's also a good time to try out some new channels, honestly. Ads have been great for a long time. They're not going away, but there's other things out there. You know, owned and earned media has always been a good option. Now it's probably a good time to start paying a little bit more attention to that because ads are relatively less of a low hanging fruit. If you're looking for a timeline on when you should expect Scan 4.0, my best guess at this point is sometime later this year, end of Q4, possibly early Q1. Put a placeholder in your engineering roadmap, there's gonna be a little bit of work to do at some point there. And then if you really want to get ahead of the curve, you can test Privacy Sandbox probably early in 2023. Like the infrastructure is being built right now, you can get ahead of the curve so it'll be a super smooth transition, but you have a little bit more time there. And then finally, uh, don't panic, because this is actually the kind of thing that makes mobile exciting. It's such a dynamic space. There's always chaos, but that means there's always opportunity. So if you stay on top of it, that's actually your competitive advantage, and it's a fun place to be. So if you liked this talk, if you want coverage on more things like this, if you don't already get my mobile growth newsletter in your inbox, you can sign up, and I send it every couple of weeks. Otherwise, thank you very much.